Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young from K-State Online with you as we get ready for another week of Wildcat football. K-State off the bye week and ready to hit the road for Stillwater, Oklahoma, a place that they haven't won at since 2017. Owen two there under Chris Kleiman, and uh, both games have not necessarily been the prettiest for K-State, so they're going to look to buck that trend when they go down there this week. They are also trying to make sure they stay on pace in the Big 12 with uh, three teams that went to 2-0 this weekend, two that were expected, one of which uh, I don't know that anybody would have told you they'd be 2-0 to start conference play. A lot of people probably would have said, yeah, they'll be 0-2. Uh, no, that would be the West Virginia Mountaineers tied for first in the Big 12 uh, as we head into week six of the college football season. So we will have plenty of that to dive into and, uh, you know, a little bit on the Wildcats as they come off this bye week. No game to recap, but still plenty of storylines heading into this week with Oklahoma State. So, D.Y., I'll, um, I'll open it up with this for you. What was the, the number one takeaway you had from the Big 12 this weekend where K-State sat on their couch and watched everybody else beat each other's heads in? That teams ranked fourth through about 10th or 11th are all the same. <laughs> there are... Here, is there much separation between these programs? West Virginia, KU, TCU, Texas Tech, BYU, UCF, and I think now you could probably even include Cincinnati and Baylor. Maybe not Cincinnati, maybe Baylor. Um, there is like nine to ten teams here that are all just the same. Like the caliber is indistinguishable. Like I would probably have Cincinnati 10th or 11th in, in my power rankings with Baylor. UCF 9th, but if someone had UCF 5th, like would I throw a fit? Probably not. But that was obviously a tough loss. I would – West Virginia's probably deserving to be 4th in the Big 12 power rankings, but if you still had them 9th, would someone really throw a fit? Probably not. It's just – man, it's, it's going to be unpredictable – it's probably going to cannibalize itself to even be more unpredictable because like all of those teams can beat each other. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, trying to, to order, you know, big 12 power rankings this week is going to be a mess because I, I think number one is still clear. It is Texas. Although, you know, they ended up pulling away from KU and they, they did some things to make it a little bit tougher on themselves. They still won by a wide margin, but I think that there were some things that I saw with Texas that made me think that they're more gettable after what they did against KU than what I originally thought. They're still maybe, maybe. they're still easily the best team in the league right now. And then I think you drop down a step. It's K-State and Oklahoma. And then I think there's another little gap there. And then it's KU. And right now you probably have to lump West Virginia in there with how they're playing and the fact that they're winning these games. Um, but – I, you know, I'm still not convinced that they've gotten wins against good teams. They've beaten some teams we thought were going to be okay this year in TCU and Texas Tech. But, like, I don't put any stock into their win against Pitt. Pitt's terrible. Um, yeah. so I, I it's just tough to order them because what do you do with a team like Baylor now? I mean, Baylor was very close to being at the bottom of these lists, and then all of a sudden this big comeback, they beat a team that if they had won, UCF probably would have been staking claim to the, the fourth best team in the league. And what do you do with UCF now? They're 0-2. Yeah, exactly. It's The Big 12 is, is crazy this year, and I think people probably need to get more accustomed to this because you're playing in a league that doesn't have divisions, so common opponents are going to be infrequent, and you are doing this with 14 teams this year. Next year, it's going to be with 16 teams. So the teams that can lose these games, there is a better likelihood that they continue to lose them or beat up on some other bad ones like – OU, Texas, and K-State, the three best teams in the league, they are, for the most part, going to play some schedules independent of each other. It's not going to really matter what they do um, against each other because K-State doesn't play Oklahoma, obviously, and then the common opponents elsewhere aren't necessarily the same. We know that because we look at Oklahoma's schedule at the start of the year, and outside of their game with Texas, they have a very favorable schedule for what they can do. So it's only going to become more the norm over the next year especially with the fact that, you know, the teams leaving are better than the teams coming in outside of maybe Utah. Um, so it, it, this is just something to get accustomed to in the Big 12. I think people have always, you know, known that this was a thing, especially with how the basketball side of it has always worked. 
football has it to some extent, but this year it's it's so few with the the great teams at the top, um, as evidenced by the fact that there's only two teams in the top 25 right now from the Big 12. So it's going to continue, and we'll see how it looks uh, after this week where there are a handful of more games that can maybe give us a little bit more clarity. See, I, I had a different takeaway on Texas. Usually when they play like a, a C game or a D game, um, that's the one that comes back to bite them and, and they lose, right? That's what yeah. we've been accustomed. Instead, we got a, a C or a D game from Texas, and they still beat Kansas, who is probably at least a middle-tier Big 12 team, 40 to 14, um, when it very easily could be. If Texas played a B game, that's probably 61 to 14. That's – how lopsided it truly was between those two. Texas's issues in the red zone um, obviously made that probably more of a game than it should have been. But yeah, I come away being more thinking Texas is even scarier than we thought because with a performance that typically is what hurts them throughout a season, like the past, what, 10 to 15 years, and as the reason why they lose a game, Instead, they're able to overcome it and still win by 26. So I come away more impressed by Texas and thinking that the gap is even wider than we thought. Yeah, we'll we'll just have to uh, we'll have to see what what comes out of it. I just, I mean, uh, you're right. Other Texas teams they probably they might lose that game to KU on yes. Saturday, yep. uh, and and they put them away. Still, I just you know there there were moments in that game where you can see that they're vulnerable, and maybe it's in the sense of like. They're not as good as Alabama was last year because Alabama actually had a quarterback. I still don't think Quinn is is anything special. Um, but they were kind of in that vein where that Alabama team was beatable. K-State could have beaten that Alabama team last year. It's just a lot of things would have had to have gone their way, and they played that game. And outside of Deuce breaking off the big touchdown run, they didn't really have things go their way. They had, you know – what a drop in the end zone for a touchdown. They they didn't score in the red zone. They were aggressive at times. It just didn't work out. Um, and Alabama was able to, to handle it from there. Texas is not to that level, but I think it's probably going to be a similar game for a lot of teams that play them, especially ones that maybe have more talent and uh, you know, just the better pedigree to match up like K-State and OU will this year, is if you're not on your P's and Q's, you are going to get beat by this Texas team. But they are beatable as opposed to, I think going into last week, I had a tough time seeing anybody beating this Texas team based off how they were, everybody else was playing as well as what Texas was doing. So we'll That's just fair. But that, that might have been the worst you'll see Texas. Like they played a bad game and still won by 26. Yeah. Typically when they play their bad game, like I said, they lose. They, they, they played their bad game and still beat, what, a number five, number six team in the Big 12 by 26. Yeah. So I just think that, if Texas is playing a bad game and still winning by beating a decent Big 12 team by three to four touchdowns, then they're going to have a cakewalk because this is the – I mean, the other teams in the Big 12 this year are just not the same. I mean, they saw better teams in the Big 12 last year than this year. I'll yeah, put that one. that's true. Uh, we're still we're still five weeks, a month away from the Texas game. This week it's all about Oklahoma State and K-State little Friday night showdown in Stillwater. It'll be a uh, 6.30 kick on ESPN for everybody that isn't going to make the trip to Stillwater. But I could envision a pretty strong purple contingent, even though it's allegedly a sellout down there. I don't know. I I saw how Baylor's sellout looked last year and uh, looked pretty open and empty. So I don't know. We'll see what they do down there. I, I don't – Oklahoma State is not Baylor. We'll put it that way. They, they typically – pack the house at T Boone Pickens Stadium. And I expect them to do the same. It's a Friday night game. Uh it'll be fun. It'll be, you know, something different night game. And they're going to see this as a potential last stand. Yeah. Uh the fans, the students, even the team and the coaching staff probably, they can in a way save their season with a really good performance. I know that people some people are very annoyed when I say this. Mm -hmm. But K-State has a target on their back because they're the defending Big 12 champions. But Oklahoma State, with the way their season has unfolded, you're probably going to get the best version of Oklahoma State so far this year, in my opinion, because this is the way that they can kind of reverse things. Now, if they lose this, then all bets are off. That's why I said this game and the score will probably not be indicative of what Oklahoma State is, especially if Kansas State were to win, because I think Kansas State, Oklahoma State's going to play their best game of the year, in my opinion because 
You have the the target on the Big 12 champions, and you beat them 48 to zero last year. Yeah. We're going to remember that as well. And like I said, two and two, just two terrible performances in a row where you're losing to Iowa State. You're getting blasted at home by South Alabama. Your two wins were not even that good. Yeah. This is a way that you can flip the season back on its head a little bit if if you're Oklahoma State. So Kansas State has to know this. I'm sure they do, but you're going to also get Oklahoma State coming off a bye week, and they're going to empty the tank similarly to what we saw from Missouri. So, I mean, do you think – I, you know, I, I was discussing this last night. I mean, is there any realm in which Oklahoma State can win this game? Like what – I mean, can, it, can they realistically win this? Because I, I truly don't think they can. I think they are that bad, and I would be impressed in a very, very bad way if K-State came out so bad after a bye week they lost to Oklahoma State because this is a terrible football team. Yeah, but a, but a guy that knows ball, and you could say what you want about Mike Gundy, a guy that knows ball, he does. He's got he's got two weeks to prepare for this. Like Kansas State isn't so super talented that they can't be out schemed and caught on the road. Um, this is still the Big Twelve, and this is still Mike Gundy. So it shouldn't happen, but it absolutely can happen because Oklahoma State's going to play their best game. And they're going to empty the tank. It's like, I don't think they're as good as Missouri, so it might not be good enough. But they're they're going to put up a fight, and it's going to, at least for the first half, of my opinion, be pretty ugly. Okay. Well, we'll see. I I just, I, I right now, I'm the total opposite of you on this. I, I mean, I get what you're saying and where you're coming from. It Don't worry. I, you're, it's based in logic. I don't think you're dumb for thinking this. But I just... I just see a bad, bad, bad football team, and I, I can't get over that. I get it, but we thought the same of Iowa State and Baylor, and they've gotten yeah. themselves off the mat a few times already this year. Like, think about as bad. Think about how bad we thought Baylor was, and they came back from down thirty-five yeah. to seven against the team that we thought is not bad, right? Yeah. So this is anything could happen. It's a conference game on the road. You just can't take it for granted. You know that that's it's fair. Um, I you know Baylor though. I I thought they'd be a little bit different on Saturday. Th- now that Shapin was back, I guess it's the way it unfolds though. You know that yeah. first half, you're sitting there thinking, oh man, yeah, Baylor just flat sucks this year. But they they flipped it on, uh, and we'll see what comes out of that. Uh, you know we've talked a lot about guys getting healthy for K State the bye week. Typically, you probably don't want it this time of year. You get it right now though. What does that mean to you? Where where do you think K-State stands health-wise with guys like Christian Duffy and Jake Clifton who were limited in the game against UCF and, and anybody else that probably needs uh, to to get some, some better health like Keegan Johnson? I would just imagine that outside of Keegan Johnson because I don't know when he's not going to be limited. And hopefully he's not going to be limited at all this week. Uh, but it's, it's hard to, to pin the tail on the donkey there and, and know how that's going to unfold. But guys like Christian Duffy, Jake Clifton, Trayshawn Ward, RJ Garcia, I'd imagine all are near 100% and are not going to be necessarily limited on Friday. Well, that's it's good news for K-State. I think uh, we saw a little bit of an idea of how things can look when they, they have Christian Duffy back on the offensive line. Obviously, it was their best running game of the year. I don't know that Christian Duffy was the sole reason for that, but I think it definitely helped to have him back not only physically, but also there's a mental side of that when, you, when you're, you've got more of your strength, more of your guys. Um, that makes a, a lot of sense. So we'll see how that goes. I'm interested in that. And, you know, to, to get probably a closer to full strength Jake Clifton in that game, get in the play uh, in his home state on a Friday night, that'll probably be a, a pretty entertaining thing for him. Uh, what are some other storylines this week for K-State that we should uh, be tracking and following along with as they get ready for – their second Big 12 game? Probably just maybe the – and I, I don't know that it's going to be significant because they probably just start it a day earlier. So they just start and pretend like Sunday is Monday, Monday is Tuesday, and so forth. But just being an odd week. You got to play it on Friday. Um, I think, yeah, you just – and both teams are going to go through it. But I think it's different with the routine, especially as the road team, though, because you mm-hmm. also – have travel involved with that. So and that's not to lay out an excuse, but as a road team playing on a weeknight, I think that sometimes upsets the equilibrium a little bit more. Yeah, no, you're right. It's it's definitely a little strange. Uh, and even, you know, with the bye week, 
I, I think you still want to try and replicate a normal week. And so you can try and say, hey, we're going to treat Saturday like Sunday and Sunday is Monday. You still know in the back of your head, though, like, OK, well, everything else I do on a Saturday I've done today but we're trying to act like it's Sunday or it probably feels even more like that on like a Sunday where it's like, yeah, okay. My Monday routine is normally this, but like I don't have to go to class today because it's actually Sunday. So I think there's a lot of things that play into that where uh, I could see the routine being thrown off a little bit. Um, when, you know, this is more of a broad question for you, but you've covered the sport and been around it for a long time. D Y explain to people that, that might not, you know, understand how this works. Where do you think K State's focus was during the bye week? How much of these, you know, essentially two weeks leading up to the game with Oklahoma State is focused on what they can do specifically to Oklahoma State, and how much of it was, you know, spent on fixing themselves and getting better on areas that K State specifically is lacking? They probably focused on themselves in terms of what the negatives are, whether that be the inexperience. So it was for their problems on the defensive side of the ball are more attached to inexperience than anything. So in that vein, they're probably getting those younger players, uh, Jay Clifton, Desmond Purnell, and not to say he's been bad, he's been pretty good. Asa Newsome, Austin Romain, first-year starters in the secondary, Jacob Parrish, Will Lee, Marquis Siegel, uh, VJ Payne, um, first-year starters on the defensive line, like Uso Sayamala, maybe Damian Nalalio, that's his backup. You get those guys as many reps as possible because you're trying to accelerate their learning process, their development process, because some of those guys are making mistakes because they're playing in their first games of college football. That's why we're seeing some of the big plays being allowed by K-State. So you just, some guys need to decelerate because they played so much football like Austin Moore, Khalid Duke, like in a bye week, you're probably decelerating them. They don't, they're not going to experience any growth if, they're, if you did unload them throughout a bye week. But it's the younger guys that don't have a lot of experience that you're you're really ratcheting up, especially the guys that have been hurt and haven't played a whole lot of football this year too. So I would look at it that way. And offensively, maybe you're tweaking some things and trying to catch the other team off guard, um, looking ahead. to. So some of it's looking ahead to Oklahoma State, but it's not all of it. Um, because you do have to self-assess and kind of – because especially defensively, I don't think it's been as much as the other team, as much as it has been Kansas State kind of self-destructing at times. Um, but expectedly, because of how many first-year starters you are deploying. And you got to remember, when it gets to Thursday, Friday, we saw this, the coaches are leaving and going to recruit anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're, you know, the inmates are running the asylum then. It's just, you know, hey – no, uh, I, I think it's I think it's something that you know some people obviously know from years of following along, but others probably a little bit you know interested in how the structure of everything goes. And I, I think that's probably the thing with the bye week system in college football that can be a little wacky uh, at times. It's you know you think about how early it can come for some teams like K State this year. Uh, it, it probably also depends on when you have it happen during the season. Uh, a couple of other things in regards to this game with Oklahoma State. We talked about it on the Sunday show yesterday with Drew and Fan. Um, Oklahoma State has been susceptible to a quarterback that we don't think is very good in a passing offense that has struggled in Iowa State, like Rocco Beck, uh, their quarterback. He lit him up over 300 yards, three yeah, touchdowns. Last week too. Yeah, he played all right against Oklahoma, who might have a, a comparable defense to Oklahoma State right now. Um what do you think of the strategy being for K-State? Should they just go out there and put the ball in Will Howard's hands in Stillwater and say, hey, go out there and put it to him early? Like, you're the guy. They're susceptible here. Let's try and attack him in a weak spot. It'll get you some confidence, test out the connection with the receivers, and just try and get things going in big plays early and often. you got to remember Will Howard just shredded Oklahoma State last year too yeah. when they won 48-0. to He's the one getting hauled off. You know, they, they picked him up mm -hmm. on their shoulders and carried him off the field. I mean, that was a heck of a performance. So, Will Howard destroyed Oklahoma State last year. We're seeing average quarterbacks destroy Oklahoma State this year. I think he'd be an idiot not to try to continue to expose and exploit that. Uh, Oklahoma State will probably be ready for it, but I think you should at least unload the clip until they prove to you that they can stop it. All right. Well, then the inverse of that would be the running game. 
Uh, we assume that Treshawn Ward probably going to be back this week, and it'll be interesting to see what the workload looks like for him. DJ Giddens is obviously coming off of the career game that he had against UCF. Uh, through the first three weeks of the season, they had identical numbers in terms of carries. Now we know that DJ Giddens had that game as a solo standout. How do you think that the running back committee kind of progresses throughout the season now? Are we are we trending more towards, hey, it's going to be Giddens with 20, 25 carries a game, and then it's something like Ward is less lesser to you know 10 or less and use maybe more in the passing game? I, I mentioned yesterday maybe similar to how James Gilbert and Jordan Brown were used in 2019 with Chris Kleiman. Um, how do you see the, the running back situation playing out when K-State needs to turn to the run game this week? Yeah, I wouldn't hate that. I think you bring up a good point. The only thing is you don't want to become predictable. Like Giddens is in the game, yeah. we're going to run the ball. Treshawn Ward's in the game. And I think I think Treshawn Ward probably better as a as a standard running back than what Jordan Brown was. I, I think he's yeah. built a little bit better and, for that. And, DJ, yeah. and, and you don't want to you don't want to eliminate DJ Giddens from the passing game because he's been a weapon in that front no, as just, well. Yeah, he just had almost ninety yards receiving for you. So yeah, you you better still use him there. Yeah, so I don't know if you can go run pass with the way you're working it, but I do imagine. And I would suspect, and personally, I would, you know, it was pretty close 50 50. I think in the first game was a little bit more Giddens. Like, I would lean into Giddens more because even, and you know this, even before the, I do know the near, but yeah, but even before the near 300 yard performance, I was saying I think Giddens is a lot better than Ward. Now, a lot better is maybe hyperbolic, although he did, didn't. Get three hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, three hundred yards the next week, and kind of prove my point. I th I think there is a gap between those two. I think Ward's good enough to play, and I think you need to play him because you don't want to run Giddens into the ground, so to speak. But I, I think you're a better football team when DJ Giddens is getting the ball. Yeah, I think uh, I th you know I think DJ Giddens definitely proved himself there, and it's not necessarily like Treshawn Ward did anything wrong. It's just a guy saw an opportunity and he literally ran with it. So yep. uh, we'll see what it looks like there, but I think that's going to be a fascinating thing to follow. And yeah, I don't think it'll be as heavy and severe like the Gilbert Brown thing, but it probably develops a little bit more that way based off of what now you, you truly realize what you have with DJ Giddens. I think, you know, obviously the people inside of veneer and people around K state, obviously, you know, you saw it in DJ Giddens, knew that he was capable of being the lead back for K-State and handling the workload himself, but now he actually has the physical evidence and made it manifest in the last game against UCF, and uh, they'll probably try and ride that a little bit more, which is probably a smart thing to do. Uh, and if if he is struggling in the game, Treshawn Ward is still more than capable of, of picking everything up and uh, and running with it as well. Now, it does change the, the, the blocking scheme up a little bit because with DJ Gaines, they run a lot more – power yeah um, more gap scheme stuff rather than zone scheme which was what they did a lot last year and and that's okay but if they're going to do that they probably need to incorporate more play action into it as well which would make sense if you go with more 12 personnel if garrett oakley is what we think he is as well yeah and garrett oakley we saw you know a little flash of him in the game against ucf uh, you expect a, a more looks and an expanded role against oklahoma state this week then to you know, get a little bit more of a two tight end look for for the Wildcats. Obviously, Ben Sennett is great at what he does. Yeah, it'll it'll be nice, and that might have been something that they were able to do in those two weeks. One, like Clifton, like Duffy, like Garcia, like Ward. You got to get this guy going, right? Ramp him up, get those reps, uh, because he's somebody that they want to be able to count on. So they were probably able to do or show a lot of their or rep a lot of their maybe double tight stuff during that time to have it really ready to click uh, when ball meets the foot on Friday night. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll be looking forward to the cats and Cowboys. Uh, we will dive into now, look at around the big 12 and the big 12 scoreboard from the weekend. Give some more thoughts. We started the show with a little bit of it, but uh, we'll, we'll give uh, some deeper ones and also some takeaways from each game. And then quick look ahead. We'll be done. Nice tidy show on Monday for everybody since uh, no, no cats game to recap. And then we'll be back. Uh, on Wednesday to go over everything that Chris Kleiman said in his press conference, what stood out, uh, what it all means. And then uh, we'll have to uh, – well, still determining, I guess, uh, 
when we'll have the the preview pod out since we got to move that up a day. It's not just the team that's having to reshuffle their schedule. Uh, we'll we'll have to figure out how we want to do that. But uh, here's a look if you're watching on the YouTube the Big 12 scores from the weekend. BYU kicked it off on Friday night with a win over Cincinnati. Cincinnati just good enough not to like feel like they're terrible, but clearly not good enough to be considered a good team. And then Texas beat KU 40 to 14. Texas Tech, they struggled with Houston there early. It was tied at halftime. Tech pulled away, won 49 to 28. UCF surrenders a 28 point lead to lose to Baylor 36 35. Oklahoma flirted with Iowa State in the first half, then put the hammer down in the second to win 50 to 20. And West Virginia, with the shocker of all shockers, they win 24 to 21 in Fort Worth. And uh, they did it. They were losing guys left and right. TCU fans were being idiots again. Uh, what, did, what what was the the number one takeaway from games outside of you know maybe KU and Texas this week in the Big Twelve? There's three of them, right? It's like Baylor got off the mat and UCF face planted. I would think that registers to me. Texas Tech got off the mat a little bit finally by winning by three touchdowns. And then uh, West Virginia, you're sitting there 2-0 and in the Big 12. And TCU, that's a bad loss to take at home. Uh, so those things kind of go into it. And it kind of brings me to a little bit of a crescendo where I think some of those things that I just said, the takeaways, boils into this week where you got UCF at 0-2 in the Big 12. Like this season's going one of two ways at this mm-hmm. point. And one of them's really bad. And the only way to avoid that is a win at KU. That's tough. Yeah. So that, that two huge games this week, in my opinion, UCF at Kansas and Texas Tech at Baylor. Like, sorry, Red River rivalry, but like, <laughs> yeah, I, like it's funny because I think Texas is just going to have their way with Oklahoma again. That's kind of where I think that that one is headed. But in terms of significant, because of what I think that result is going to be in a lock to be that, I think the more consequential games this week are. Texas Tech at Baylor and UCF at Kansas. And I'm very intrigued by those two games. Want to watch both and tune in. So I'm glad Kansas State plays on a Friday night, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a limited Big 12 schedule, honestly. Just the five games now in a traditional year, what we've gone over the last decade, that's been the norm. But with uh, the other teams this year, we're missing a couple games. But you look at it and you just have the K-State State game Friday. You only have four games on Saturday. Obviously, UCF Kansas is probably the most interesting one to me because uh, that, I mean, that game has a number of ways that it could go. If you told me right now that one of those teams won in a blowout, I wouldn't be surprised if it was KU or UCF. And then if you told me that it came down to the last play of the game, I also would not be surprised. I think that they are probably two teams that could play a uh, a, a really tight game with each other, and it's going to be interesting to track their quarterback situation in that game because obviously Jalen Daniels did not go at Texas. Kind of interesting there. Uh, and then John Rice Plumley, uh, he was in uniform, right? And and he was, I guess, cleared to play, but he didn't go. Uh, so I would expect that he's back for the game in Lawrence, but that's uh, that's going to be a big one, 3 o'clock Saturday afternoon. I'll be curious. There, there probably is going to be a lot of points if, if I yeah. was to – and then, like, does Tech – fully ingest a heartbeat back into their season with the win at Baylor on the road. If they're just destroying Houston, that's possible. Or does Baylor, which yeah. which team resurrects their season, Texas Tech or Baylor? Because someone is resurrecting it. If you're Kansas State, you'd rather Baylor win? Because if so, then you know Lubbock that following week when yeah. Kansas State gets there will not be as on fire. Now, if Tech is coming off back-to-back wins against Houston and Baylor or has their season in a little bit of a revival mode, Um, you can expect the Red Raiders to really greet the Wildcats with a lot of hostility the following week. Yeah, I mean, you think about it. If Tech loses this weekend, they would drop to four losses already on this season. They would be two and four. Just seems like things would be headed in a a not-so-good direction. And, I mean, Tech, they still have some really tough games left on their schedule if they were to lose this weekend. I mean, you look around at what's left. Obviously, K-State coming to town the following week. But they still have to go to KU, UCF, and TCU will come to to uh, Lubbock, and then they have the road game at Texas to end the regular season. Like this is a Tech team that there are a handful of people that are thinking, "Hey, 
They could finish third, myself included. They could be in Arlington. And now they're looking at, I mean, they're going to have to scratch and claw to make sure that they get to their six wins because no game on their schedule looks like it's going to come easy now. Now, for what it's worth, and this is not me trying to, to dunk the basketball or spike the football here, but this is why I wasn't as high on them being a dark horse Big 12 title contender as others because think about everyone else's schedule. Like even yeah. Kansas State, Oklahoma, Texas, KU to an extent, you, you know, Baylor, like – Compared to all them, Texas Tech had a rough schedule. I mean, yeah, they were the one Big Twelve team that just did not get the benefit of the doubt. No, no, they got they got a they got a tough blow here. I mean, they fortunately they didn't have to face Oklahoma, but not great. And they, I mean, tough tough road games too. The fact that they have probably the two longest trips in the league this year. They go to they went to Morgantown. They still have to go to Provo as well. And they then, went to they went to Wyoming. Yeah, he went to what? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess they just love the mountains down there. They want to get <laughs> closer went, to them. They went to Wyoming. They got to go to BYU. They went to West Virginia, and they played Oregon in the non-con. I mean, their yeah. schedule. I, that's why I said it in the preseason. Like Texas Tech's schedule did not set them up for success at all. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a whack schedule now that you look at it because a lot of teams when they play the five road games in conference you try to play all three uh, non-con games at home they went to wyoming to start the year they still had five road games left and i don't know that's that's wild to me uh and they, and now they that hosted, you evaluate it deeper yeah and they hosted who i think is probably i get what they're not but probably deserving to be the number one team in the country right now because no one's been better this year than oregon yeah i i, I couldn't argue with that i think uh i think oregon Oregon and Washington are the two teams out west to watch. I mean, Washington's although pretty Washington lucky, but Oregon's just, got a good blend of everything. Although Washington just you know barely escaped Arizona. So. Yeah, he was playing their backup quarterback uh for, for part of that game. Uh and yeah, I'm aware that Washington did not uh did not play that but, to a yeah. blowout. And I was talking about this on the our Patreon podcast on Three Mile, but like in the SEC, like LSU, you thought or was maybe that team was going to come out of there. They have two losses now. Yeah. Florida State's a good loss. That was a tough game. I get it. Played good. But that Ole Miss loss is bad for LSU because they still have some games on the schedule that are losable. Georgia, they're undefeated, but they, they haven't played nobody. Yeah. And they haven't looked good. Uh, they escaped Auburn. They could lose this week to Kentucky, and it would not surprise me. They're, they're, and Alabama is a shell of themselves at this point. Tennessee doesn't have a quarterback if they keep sticking with Joe Melton. So nobody in the SEC, you could say. So it sounds like you're saying Missouri is the best team in the SEC right now. Kentucky, actually, Kentucky's probably playing the best. I look, I got no problem with that. Which is wild about Kentucky because the Kentucky started their season with a terrible showing at home against uh, an F an FCS opponent. Like they struggled early in the season against Eastern Kentucky. It was second week of the year. That game. They, it was tied at seven at halftime uh, with Eastern Kentucky before they finally ended up winning 28 to 17. And, you know, K State fans know a thing or two about struggling with Eastern Kentucky and what that can do for a season. You can, you can really springboard from that. The Colonels are a good test uh, early in the year, I, I suppose. But in, in, yeah, I was going to say, in terms of body of work, you would not pick any of the SEC teams to be in the top three. I yeah. think you'd probably take Florida State because they beat Clemson and LSU, even though Florida State hasn't always looked sharp. Mm -hmm. I, I don't take Michigan because they, they haven't played anybody. Like, literally, nobody. The best Their best opponent's been Nebraska, I think, and that's saying something. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, and that's not even hyperbole. Go look who they beat. No, you're right. I mean, it, it is true. <laughs> so, so, so who, who are the best teams in terms of body of work and, and how they're playing? Like, four, state, four states, probably three, I guess. But I'm taking – one Oregon and two Texas, probably. Yeah, I would I would probably agree with that. Uh, I think you're probably right. Yeah, Michigan, man, <laughs> I don't know how somebody is able to find a schedule that that nice and cushy. <laughs> they threw five games this year. Uh, you may know this, Dy, because you're a Michigan hater and you're probably using this as like fuel. But uh, do you know how many points they've allowed through five games this season? Oh, ten. Well, about 10 a game, uh, actually less than that. They've given up 30 total points this year 
Three to ECU, seven to UNLV, six to Bowling Green, seven to Rutgers, and seven to Nebraska. And I think those were pity points that they gave Nebraska at the end of the game. Uh, so, it was a, and it was a 74 yard run. So Nebraska let's, just let's, lucked out there. Let, let's emphasize this. Go through those five opponents that they beat so far. Mm-hmm. East Carolina, yeah, UNLV, <laughs> Bowling Green. Rutgers, Nebraska. Rutgers is probably the best team they played. Rutgers or UNLV. They're four and one, right? Yeah. Hey, Bowling Green, big road win at, at Georgia Tech Georgia this State. weekend. So yeah. uh I don't know. That's a P five win. More probably uh more P five wins than Nebraska has this year, right? Uh, uh pretty, pretty sure. So yeah, yeah. they haven't won a P five game. So there you go. How, so how does like literally like why are we giving Michigan credit for this? That's, I, I guess I could go on a on a rate here that I probably shouldn't. Like uh, it's not getting any better. Like their next yeah. two, their next, their next four games are against Minnesota, who's down, Indiana, who's not making a bowl, Michigan State, who's a disaster, and Purdue, who's probably not making a bowl. Yeah, no, you uh, you're not wrong there. I I'm I am impressed by what they've done. Uh, t- turning this back to the Big Twelve real quick, uh, and and kind of stemming off of this, how has the first Two and a half weeks of Big 12 play. I say half because there's that extra week with TCU and Houston playing to start things off. But how has how the Big 12 played out changed your opinion of what K-State can do with the schedule that they have? Because we, we looked at it at the start of the year when we thought Oklahoma has a very kind schedule, which is weird that you would give Oklahoma a team departing a very nice schedule. But it, you looked around, you're like, eh, you know, K-State, it's not the toughest thing in the world, but it's probably tougher than OU's, maybe tougher than Texas's. Uh, where would you grade what K-State can do to their schedule now versus where you had it at the start of the year? I think the next two weeks are critical because you have a chance to steal two road games because of the way the season has unfolded for both Oklahoma State and Texas Tech. And if you do that, no, the sky's probably the limit at that point for Texas or for Kansas State because they're. I'd be shocked if Kansas State loses a home game at this point. They, mm-hmm. They're look, they still have four home games left, which is also a big deal because yeah. you started you started out one one and zero in the Big Twelve. If you win those home games, which you should, it's literally yeah. three of the four bottom feeders with Houston, Baylor, and Iowa State, and then TCU had just lost at home to West Virginia. Win those four. That's why I say the next two games are critical because they're gettable road games yeah. against Oklahoma State and Texas Tech. That's you're guaranteed at least seven and two in a Big Twelve. Yeah, and I mean you, you look at how the schedule ends up working out. You get through the next two weeks, the last month and a half of your season, you only leave the state of Kansas once to go face Texas. You know that's that's pretty significant. Uh, so we'll we'll have to monitor and see. But uh, yeah, some some decent games in the Big Twelve this week. Good for everybody that uh, they get to watch uh, K State on a Friday night and settle in for everything else on Saturday and just kind of have an extra bye week. Yeah, we we discussed this last week, so I'm not going to do a, a complete swan dive into the Sunflower Showdown. <laughs> but based off what we just saw from TCU, the the two toughest games left on the Kansas State schedule are at Texas and at Kansas. Yeah, and both and none of those happen until November. Yeah. So not that they have a they get any breaks. They don't. Now I will make an, an addendum to that. Where I would say if Texas Tech beats Baylor this week, that game in Lubbock becomes a lot more difficult. Yeah. It, yeah. If if Texas Tech can go through and uh salvage the season and rally the troops, they there will be life there. And uh I also think, well, we should be getting game time sometime soon. Uh, for yeah. that game with Texas yeah. Tech, so uh, at I wonder some point, we might get the the wait. Yeah, it could be a six day selection waiting on uh, that, how that, games that, play that, this week. Yeah, that'd be a good time to do it because they they may. I could see Fox wanting to wait to see what Tech does against Baylor. Yeah, uh, by the time people are hearing this, you probably already will know. Uh, yeah. how that ends up working out, but it's something to to keep in mind and we'll see because that also could could play a little bit of a factor. You know, obviously a night game in Lubbock with a team that's re-energized is a lot trickier than going down there at 11 a.m. to face a team that's dead in the water. So what, Another thing I will say is, well, two things, but first, if Tech loses to Baylor, that, that could just become an ESPN Plus game and Tech puts it at night anyway. Yeah, because true. They, they, get a, they get a make that call. And two... The six-day wait would suck 
for us in general. Yeah. Like the only two games where a six day wait would be painful for us is like a road trip to Lubbock and a road trip to Morgantown, the two toughest places to yeah. go. And you only get like six days in advance. That that's yeah, that sucks. Yeah, no, that that does make it tough. Uh, or I mean, now too. I guess. Gonna, yeah, yeah have to put in an extra phone call to the private jet guy and be like, "Hey, man, we we don't know what time we're leaving yet uh, Saturday morning based off game time." Now, right now, the only flight that you have to take is to go to West Virginia. Well, until this year, yeah, and we don't, and we don't have to do it this year. UCF certainly a flight. Is BYU a flight or is that drivable? Uh, I, I think that's probably a flight. I I would imagine. Uh, and, it's probably, and it's probably like Morgantown where you get a fly into Salt Lake and then rental car it to Provo. Let's see. Uh, what is Manhattan to Provo? Oh, it's giving me Manhattan, New York. We don't want that. We want the real Manhattan, Manhattan, Kansas. I mean, yeah, if you want to drive 14 hours, D.Y., that's that's hey, fair game. I mean, I drove to Houston before, so that's like 11. I think – well, yeah, I mean, then, you know, that l- drive from Lubbock can feel a little bit crazier. My guess is that you probably f- fly into Salt Lake City, and then it's like a 45-minute drive to Provo from there. So it's like Morgantown to Pittsburgh, yep. Yeah, so, although, I mean, w- which one do you think is the more scenic drive, Salt Lake City to Provo? Or more, probably, probably Salt Lake City to Provo. Morgantown to Pittsburgh is not as scenic as you would think. <laughs> yeah well i think i think driving through the state of west virginia the way i put it because i had never been to west virginia in my life and then within this last year i've i've been through it twice you know on the way to when i went to morgantown for the football game last year and then on the way to greensboro for the ncaa tournament driving if you aren't driving through like a, an inhabited city in west virginia it is it's actually pretty beautiful but when you drive through any town that has any form of population and, you know, life, it's th- the most disgusting thing you've ever seen. It's like they haven't updated the way of living in 40 years. I mean, I, I thought that, by the way, like the toll roads work there is they didn't have anything automated there yet. It was still like you got to toss quarters to like an attendant. It was it, it was bonkers. The state of West Virginia is a bonkers place. Uh, there are parts and, of the Oklahoma Turnpike that I, that well, I think yeah. are like that as well. Although I will say the most lifeless place on earth that I've driven through and nothing remotely close is Eastern Colorado. Yeah. I mean, that's fair too. Yeah. You basically, you have to like, you have Better to get over a little bit of a hump there. Um, <laughs> that's just Western Kansas adjacent, basically. <laughs> I so. Western Kansas has more life to it than Eastern Colorado. <laughs> That's true. You at least have a bunch of windmills to look at as you're driving through Western Kansas. You don't have that in Eastern Colorado. But mm-hmm. we uh, we will be back on Wednesday. Recap what Chris Kleiman had to say. Obviously, make sure that you're locked in to the K-State Online YouTube page tomorrow. That would be Tuesday to get everything Chris Kleiman says, as well as players. Uh, as we will, I, th- I think we've got players again this week since it's a game week. So we'll be able to uh, hear from them after not hearing from them during the bye week. And then uh, coordinators get moved up a day, so we get coordinators earlier in the week. But you're going to get all that on the K-State Online YouTube. And, of course, you got to make sure that you're over at On3, checking out everything that K-State Online has going on from you know anything in the recruiting world, the team space, and then, yes, uh, if you are a glutton for uh, just you know a bunch of back and forth on – K-State and everything else, you, you got to hit up the message boards as well. The foundation is always popping off with something. And uh, after a bye week, I think the mood is much more cheery. I think everybody is on the same page. Uh, Friday night at about 7 o'clock when the game is going, I'm sure there will be a lot of divisiveness again, but that will be a lot of fun to get into. So make sure that you're a part of everything we have going on at K-State Online. That will do it for Derek and me back on Wednesday with another KSO show.